Hi folks, welcome to another week. Uh, it's amazing to think, if you ask me, that we're about two-thirds of the way through our semester now. We're, we're getting into not quite the home stretch, but we're certainly moving along. So I hope you've come to find yourself in a, a nice sort of philosophical rhythm. I hope you're still enjoying what we're doing, and especially that you uh, found some things to think about with Locke, because this week we are reading George Barclay. Uh, yeah, I know, it's pronounced Barclay. Um, he was European, he was Scottish, in fact. Um, so even though it looks like Berkeley, you really want to say Berkeley, it's, it's Barclay. Uh, it'll take some getting used to, so I apologize if it's tough on the ears. And Barclay is in a lot of ways responding to Locke, and he's thinking about a lot of these same things. Uh, Barclay writes only shortly after Locke, and he is a Catholic bishop in addition to a philosopher, as was actually fairly common at the time. And Barclay has uh, two main areas that he wants to write about. Uh, the first is God and faith. This is what we actually won't read from him. The one we will read is epistemology, which, you remember, is the study of knowledge. And he's looking at the question of what can we know. And his big idea is that nothing exists except in minds. So he wants to say that there are no physical objects, there's no material stuff out there in the world. This seems pretty crazy. Barclay's maybe the most overtly uh, non-commonsensical author we're going to read, though we'll see that he'll uh, disagree with that pretty strongly. But uh, hold on and, and see if he can't convince you anyhow. So we are reading uh, Barclay's Three Dialogues. He actually makes this argument in a couple of different pieces. Uh, one of which is a very, a very, very technical, very hard to read philosophical piece. Uh, the other is this three dialogues piece that we're reading the first dialogue from, which is much more accessible. Um, of course, more accessible doesn't necessarily mean that it's easy. It, it's still pretty tough, obviously, but we'll see if we can get through it okay. So he's got two characters here, Hylas and Philonus, and these guys do not want to be skeptics. And just as a reminder, uh, skepticism they define as doubting or denying what obviously exists, according to common sense. And... So Barclay is actually really interested in common sense. He wants to be a common sense philosopher, uh, even though, as we'll see, his idea doesn't seem very commonsensical. And so Philonus has this crazy idea, um, Hylas says, that there's no such thing as material substance, or uh, in non-philosophical terms, physical stuff. There's no actual matter out there in the world. And so Hylas calls him a skeptic. Remember, a skeptic is someone who denies or doubts what exists according to common sense. And so Hylas is going to say, well, look, common sense tells me that, of course, there's physical stuff out there in the world. And you're doubting that. You're denying that, in fact. So you must be a skeptic. Philonus will say, no, I'm, I'm not the skeptic. I'm going to show you why your view is the crazy one, why there's no reason to think that there's actually physical stuff. And Barclay thinks that this is actually the common sense view. So see if you agree. They want to talk about how our senses work, and they're going to do so in a similar way to Locke, though they're not going to agree uh, with Locke's conclusion. So, Barclay says, and and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to I'm going to for the most part say what Bar just what Barclay's conclusions are, uh, not so often in terms of what Hylas and Philonus are saying. Um, I think it's more important to get the uh, philosophical point across than it is necessarily to grasp exactly what the characters think. So Barclay says that when we perceive with our senses, it must be immediate perception. And what he basically means here is there must be no middleman. So you can think of an example of immediate perception is where there is a middleman. So I can look at my computer screen and I can see a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and, and so I need to sort of think about it to realize that what I'm seeing on my computer screen right now is a PowerPoint presentation. Um, that's not something that you can just immediately sense, right? There's no sense that... In, in the human body or any other body that we know of that, that immediately picks up PowerPoint presentations, right? But we know from being a certain configuration of other stuff that this is, that this is a PowerPoint presentation. By contrast, right, we can look at, at the blue of this slide, and, and I can just know it's blue, right? I don't need to think about it. I don't need to ponder it. I don't need to think, well, what, you know, what does it mean to count as blue? I just know, right? I just see blue. So he's going to say sensible things are all immediate. For example, sound. It just happens, right? I don't need to think about it. The cause of a sound, he's going to say, is immediate, right? So I, I need to, to think about when I hear something like, right, I just clap my hands. Um, the sound is immediate, right? You just heard that noise. The cause, however, is immediate. You need to do some thinking or some investigating to figure out what that cause was. In this case, it was me clapping my hands. So there's a whole bunch of different things that we can sense, um, though it's a, maybe a smaller list than you might think, and this is going to be a, a crucial point of Barclay's argument. So here's the entire list of things we can sense, he thinks. Lights, colors, sounds, shapes, tastes, smells, and touch sensations. Basically one or two things for each of our five senses, and that's it. Anything more must be immediate, and so must come from something other than just pure senses. And we'll see if you buy this, and I think it's pretty plausible, he thinks that he can get you to, to agree that there's no such thing as physical stuff.